There are many times when I read a script when I actually get choked up and have to stop and <clears throat> get myself under control, but this film was one of those very, very powerful film. And of course, it's, it's inspiring to see what's possible in a country like China, but it is so relevant to Canada. I mean, there are dams going to be built. I'm glad the people from BC Hydro are here <laughs> because, you know, we fought against the dam at Site C on the Peace River in the 1960s and 70s, and we stopped it. We won that one. But as happens so often in environmental uh, victories, it's temporary. It's not permanent. When you lose, it's gone. But when you win, it seems to be temporary. And I think that what's going to happen now with the Peace River, this is something that the government has decided it wants to go, and it, there's a much bigger issue here, and it's about uh, liquefied natural gas uh, uh, plants uh, in, in Kitimat and, and further north, and the energy they're going to need to do all that. There's a much bigger picture here. But I think British Columbians are sleepwalking into the future. They're not aware of, of what's going on. And this film just inspires you to see, even in a country like China, where one thinks that one individual or a village is nothing when there are, what, one point how many billion human beings. And look at the power of that, of what those local people did. It's very, very inspiring for me, for, uh, for Canada. We boast of being a democracy. And boy, uh, and to see what the people there feel about achieving or approaching a democracy again should make us wonder about that. As you all know, in Canada, when people run for office, a primary source of funding for political candidates comes from rich people and corporations. Corporations aren't even people. They're structures, economic structures, and yet corporations are the major funders of campaigns for political office. So when our politicians are elected, Guess who gets first access to those politicians? Of course, it's whoever pays the piper calls the tune. And I think when we talk about democracy, we ought to be embarrassed by those people struggling for democracy and what we have today in this country. Today was an important day. Our Minister of the Environment has been on the air, refusing to say what Canada is going to do in terms of the Kyoto process and uh, the continuation in 2012. And I just want to spend some time on that because it's no big secret that Canada has turned away from the Kyoto Protocol. Ever since Mr. Harper has been our Prime Minister, he has said that he's not going to uh, uh, try to fulfill the Kyoto uh, obligations because it'll ruin the economy. Now, we seem to forget that, that uh, when Mr. Chrétien ratified the Kyoto Protocol, he didn't ratify that as a liberal. He ratified that as the Prime Minister of Canada. And he committed Canada to an international protocol that is binding to all of the countries that have signed on. When Mr. Putin ratified in 2004, it became a binding international treaty for all of the countries that had signed. So to turn Canada's back on the Kyoto pro process was to declare that we were an international outlaw, that we didn't care about commitments that this country had already made. And that's ironic coming from a government that has run in every election on law and order. Or is that law and order just for Canada? We don't have international laws that we pay attention to, but then I I realized that the Harper government passed a law mandating elections every four years on a set date, and within months he broke his own law. So you got to wonder, what the hell does law and order mean in this country anymore? I, um, of course, it's not true that uh, doing something about reducing greenhouse gas emissions will destroy the economy. Sweden is a northern country like Canada. Sweden has reduced its uh, greenhouse gas emissions 8% below 1990 levels. It did it by a carbon tax, which is now up to $120 a ton. I think we pay $25 in British Columbia. 
But their economy grew since they started the carbon tax in the 1990s. Their economy has grown by 44%. So what is this business about doing something about reducing our emissions will destroy the economy? And what about Sir Nicholas Stern, former uh, head of uh, the World Bank, or he had economist at the World Bank, who did a major study on the cost of attacking uh, climate change. And he showed that if we're serious about reducing climate, uh, the risk of climate change to a manageable level, it would cost 3 to 4% of GDP. That is a lot of money. A lot of money. But he then said, what would it cost if we don't do anything about it, as Canada has done? And that could mean the loss of up to 20% of our economy. So he, f he faced this very clearly with an economic challenge. Do something and pay for it. Pay three to four percent of our GDP every year. Or don't do anything, as Canada has done, and pay for it with the loss of up to 20 percent of our economy in the coming years. We, um, when uh, uh, the Kyoto Protocol was created in 1997, I was there. Mr. Harper and Peter Kent, our Minister of the Environment, were not. Now they say that it's not fair to have a protocol that doesn't involve major polluters like India and China. I was there at Kyoto in 1997 and so were India and China. And at that conference everyone agreed that we in the industrialized world had created the problem in the first place. It was our excessive use of fossil fuels that had built up the level of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And therefore, we were not only responsible for causing it, it was our responsibility for beginning to change that equation. So at Kyoto, it was agreed that the industrialized countries that had created the problem would cap our emissions and bring them down 6% below 1990 levels by the year 2012. The developing world was allowed to grow their economies because they hadn't created the problem in the first place. And by 2012, then the world would get together and begin to reduce our emissions. Everybody knew that. But if you've listened to what the arguments have been made in Canada, you'd never know that. We all look to China and India as the bad guys. They're re increasing greenhouse gas emissions and have become major polluters. And so why should Canada be saddled with something that uh, they're more responsible for than us? And that's a total failure to recognize the responsibility of industrialized countries. And if we, Canada, one of the richest countries in the world, cannot afford to cap and reduce our emissions, why should the developing world pay any attention to our entreaties that they've got to reduce their emissions? We set the example. They're copying us. And if we can't cap and reduce, they have absolutely no reason to try to reduce uh, theirs. We, um, Mr. Kent, two days after he was appointed Minister of the Environment, I heard him on radio say that uh, Canadian oil is ethical oil. Now, I don't understand what is ethical about Canada producing excessive amounts of greenhouse gas, resulting in the rise of oceans through thermal expansion of water and flooding out the Pacific Islands or flooding areas in Bangladesh and Egypt in the, in the, uh, Ni in the deltas. Flooding people who ha had nothing to do with creating the problem in the first place. Is that ethical? Or what about the fact that it is countries countries that are suffering from extreme uh, drought and famine in uh, Central Africa, again through no, no activity of their own but through our activity, through the burning of fossil fuels, is there something ethical about that? And what about future generations? One of the people in the film said this is a crime against future generations. Our inability to curb our greenhouse gas emissions is leaving future generations with a legacy that we created and didn't, did nothing to try to reduce. I believe that that is criminal and uh, there's nothing ethical about that. I conclude 
There is no such thing as ethical oil today in, the, in a world of increasing uh, climate change. Mr. Kent says, and I heard them just uh, last week, I heard him last week say, Canada only produces 2% of the greenhouse gases. It's a tiny amount. Wait a minute now. Canada's population is less than half a percent of the world's population, and we're producing 2% of the world's greenhouse gases? That kind of has to tell you something right there. We uh, are producing a disproportionate amount of uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas. We, um, the uh, uh, average person in China, the average person emits 4.6 tons of carbon dioxide a year. The average person in Canada emits over 18.8 tons. Did I say million? 4.6 tons of CO2 for the average Chinese, 18.8 tons for the average Canadian. And yet Mr. Kent has the nerve to say that we only produce 2% of total world greenhouse gases. Let me, uh, I just had to do that rant because it's Canada and I hope that you who are here from a Chinese background or a South Asian background will write to, to Mr. Harper and, and Mr. Kent and say, stop blaming the Chinese and the Indians for something you had a responsibility to show leadership in, to cap emissions and bring it down. And yet you keep blaming Canada's inaction on those countries. China is now a global leader in green energy production. There's just no doubt about it. I like to think that Maurice Strong, a Canadian who realized that by living in China, he might have a greater effect over there as China's economy was starting its great boom. I'd like to hope he's had some effect on this. But China has definitely embraced the green economy of the future. There's just too much of a coasting before they actually cap their building of plants, and I hope they don't go the way of nuclear as they confront the demand for a huge amount of energy in a growing economy. But they uh, passed in 2005 a renewable energy law. They uh, are the largest wind and solar manufacturer in the world. Nine out of 10 solar panels sold anywhere in the world is built in China. They, uh, more than 10% of households in China now heat their, hot, their water with solar energy. And they have over a million and a half people working in the renewable energy sector, which is growing at the rate of 300,000 jobs a year. Now, Germany showed the same thing years ago with their feed-in tariff, which is the model for uh, what Dalton McGuinty has done in Ontario with the Green Energy Act by using a, a tariff to uh, increase the incentive for people to use solar and, and wind energy. In Germany, renewable energy has been the fastest growing sector in the economy of Germany. So we've got much to learn about the opportunities. I see that Canada is now boasting about being a super, uh, an energy superpower. We may be an energy superpower because we're using last year's energy source. The real future of energy has got to be renewable. Even if we go to use up every last bit of oil we can get out of the ground, it's going to run out. We have to turn to renewable energy if we're going to be a truly sustainable society. And now with the added burden, of release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by using fossil fuels, we're going to have to leave a lot of it in the ground and see the real energy option where we could be a, we could be a superpower if we got into the renewable energy sector. So uh, the, the film has triggered all kinds of things in me that I had to respond to, but uh, I'd like to open it up to what you, uh, how you've responded to that and uh, what you're curious about. So uh, thank you for letting me rant for a few minutes here. <laughs>